Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, and we'll now reconvene the meeting to begin the next session on orthopox virus vaccines. Dr. Pablo Sanchez, chair of the work group, will provide an introduction and overview. Um, so, Dr. Sanchez. Thank you, Grace. Um, so, um, I will, um, next slide, please. I first want to thank the, um, the work group members, um, especially Beth Bell, who was the former, the previous um, chair of the work group. And also, I want to thank um, ex officio members, as well as the liaison representatives and the invited consultants, and especially um, Stuart Isaacs, as well as Jafar mm -hmm. Razek. Um, um, Jafar is from the Association of Public Health Laboratories, and they provide a really um, essential and really important um, um, help. They provide lots of help um, for these um, recommendations. Next slide. Also, um, to acknowledge the CDC contributors, and here I would very much like to acknowledge Agam Rao, who will be speaking and providing the, um, the next lectures and the next talks, as well as Brett Peterson. Um, they've just done an incredible job, and I can't thank them enough. Next slide. So at the last ACIP meeting in February, uh, we discussed background information. Um, we had four PICO questions that were drafted by the work group, and then we planned consolidation of the previous ACIP recommendations into a single updated document about ACAM 2000 with Genio's vaccine and persons at risk for occupational exposure to orthopox viruses. And then since then, uh, we've had several meetings of the work group. Uh, we added an additional uh, PICO question. We um, did the grade tables, the evidence recommendations for framework, and the wording of recommendations as well. The next slide. So today, um, Florence Whitehill will um, will speak on the grade rep, uh, presentation. Well, actually, that's online. But today's presentation that will be that is um, available online. Today's presentations um, will be by Agam. Uh, she will discuss the background information, important to understanding the grade and evidence to um, to recommendation, and then uh, discuss the framework as well. Next slide. So this is our anticipated timeline. Today will be the grade and the evidence recommendation. And then in October, uh, the clinical guidance and a vote mm -hmm. with uh, subsequent MMRWR, MMWR publication. Next slide. And thank you. And um, look forward to um, Agam's um, talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. And we'll move on to Dr. Rao. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, populations in the United States that are currently at risk for orthopox infections is, is much, much less than it used to be. So by 1972, routine smallpox vaccinations for children ended in the United States. Vaccinations to prevent smallpox have continued for some populations, such as members of the military, designated healthcare workers, and response personnel, and laboratorians with occupational risk. But then risk for orthopox infections, orthopox virus infections, are more than just smallpox risks. There are monkeypox uh, infections reemerging in parts of Africa, and you may have heard about an imported case um, into the U.S. a few months ago. Vaccinia virus is increasingly used in research laboratories to study orthopox viruses, but also as a functional vector for development of vaccines against unrelated agents. Um, and, you know, it's really hard actually to specify the exact number of persons at risk, but it's certainly much smaller than uh, for the pathogens that were discussed during previous talks today. And the reason it is a little challenging to actually settle on a specific number is that some people are not vaccinated, like the people who are dealing with maybe the less virulent orthopox viruses. Um, there isn't very good sur surveillance on this issue. And then even though CDC is the one to send out shipments of um, the vaccine, it's unclear how many people are vaccinated with um, a given shipment because these are multi-use files. 
Um, I do want to point out just on this slide before I move on, the members of the military, as you can see here, are a critical component of the, uh, and, and make up the largest proportion of people who are vaccinated. But as you know, the U.S. military and not ACIP develops vaccine recommendations for military personnel. And so um, the remainder of the presentation is, is, um, um, is, is not uh, taking the military personnel into consideration, although they may be able to adapt recommendations based on what we say about other groups. The morbidity that these populations are at risk for is well known. In inadvertent needle sticks and eye splashes have occurred among laboratorians, and several persons have been hospitalized for assessment of medical and surgical interventions. Nearly all of those have been unvaccinated people. The images on the bottom of this slide illustrate the impact that these exposures can have on persons with orthopox um, with occupational exposures. So they're not um, they're not completely benign there. Um, and it's because of this known morbidity that there have been multiple CDC guidelines about vaccination for persons at occupational risk for orthopox viruses over the last several decades. Um, these have been focused on Drivax, which is no longer available, and AKM2000, which is a clonal derivative and um, is, is available right now as well. So in 2019, Genios, which is the vaccine that we're talking about for, um, for, for all of these presentations, um, Genios joined AKM2000 as an FDA-approved vaccine to prevent orthopox virus infections. And that is the reason that this ACIP workgroup was formed. The workgroup's goals have been, as, um, uh, as mentioned previously, to develop recommendations for the newly licensed live replication deficient modified vaccinia virus vaccine, Genios, and as, to, as Dr. Sanchez mentioned, to merge all the previous CDC recommendations about, about pre-exposure use of replicating orthopox viruses with those for Genios so that everything is in one document. And the screenshots here at the bottom of this screen show um, just three of the currently applicable CDC recommendations which would be consolidated in this process. So when recommendations for Drivax and ACAM 2000 were made, there were two major considerations. Uh, and those were first, which populations should be recommended the vaccine? And then secondly, what should be said about booster doses? The populations at high risk were determined to be laboratorians who routinely work with orthopox viruses and healthcare personnel or HCP and response team members who could be at risk if they were a smallpox or monkeypox event, so for preparedness pur purposes. Populations whose contact with those viruses is limited and when it occurs is primarily to contaminated materials like dressings and while they're following appropriate infection control measures are at a much lower risk uh, for inadvertent infection, but because of that theoretical risk of infection, um, in previous ACIP recommendations, vaccination was offered to those uh, persons, but was not a firm recommendation. When recommendations for booster doses were being considered, the factor that weighed the most into recommendations was the virulence of the orthopox virus. So since there would be serious implications both to the affected individual and also to public health if infections were, um, f were like smallpox or monkeypox, the more virulent orthopox virus infections, then um, you know, that, that's a greater concern. And there would be less of a concern if a case of vaccinia or Alaska pox or cowpox or one of the less virulent orthopox viruses occurred. So for this reason, booster doses were recommended um, historically in ACIP recommendations much more frequently for persons working with those more virulent orthopox viruses than for those at risk from the less virulent ones. And for those without a continuous risk, like for example, uh, the response teams that I mentioned earlier who are vaccinated for preparedness purposes, the CDC guidance has been uh, no booster doses unless until um, there is an event at which time uh, out the door they would be vaccinated and not at specific intervals before that. So with that background, um, I just want to show you here that the ACI recommendations for ACAM 2000 can be framed in terms of these two um, of these two considerations. Um, at the top here is um, the populations for whom it was re uh, recommended or offered. And at the bottom is 
populations um, is, is recommendations that were made about booster doses. So just to, to show you here, the top part, the populations, it was uh, recommended for people at occupational risk of orthopox viruses like diagnostic laboratorians and healthcare response teams. And it was offered, but it was not a firm recommendation for persons who had a lower risk, but who um, some members of that population might, uh, might prefer to be vaccinated, like uh, people who are caring for patients who were just vaccinated with replica replication competent viruses and are dealing with the dressing changes, for example. And then um, when it comes to the uh, booster recommendations, the ACAM 2000 recommendations have always have been that persons who are continued to sustained risk are the only ones who need to receive booster doses. And then the frequency of those booster doses is um, shown here at the bottom for ACAM 2000. And as you can see, it's more, more frequently um, a booster dose is recommended for those working with the more virulent orthopox viruses um, and less frequently for the less virulent ones. So for Genios, the work group thought about those considerations that uh, went into the ACAM 2000 recommendations. The work group felt, you know, ACAM 2000 is a clonal derivative of Drybacks, and there's extensive data about Drybacks that helped inform um, ACAM 2000 recommendations. But Genios is different from ACAM 2000, and the recommendations for Genios will need to rely on data specifically about Genios. Uh, we, we can't really utilize um, a whole lot of data from ACAM 2000 to make decisions. And when we merged, um, we introduced uh, Genios into the table that I just explained. The work group felt that um, as far as populations, that the Genios recommendations probably should, um, should address the same populations and provide the same recommendations. So basically persons at occupational risk for orthopox viruses like diagnostic laboratories and healthcare response teams, the vaccine would be recommended, but, but it could be offered to persons who administer ACAM 2000 and are at lower risk for the reasons shown here. So that is how we came to the first two of our PICO questions. They have to do with the population, and those are listed here on this slide. Number one is, should Genios be recommended for research and clinical laboratory personnel performing diagnostic testing for orthopox viruses and for designated response teams at risk for occupational exposure to orthopox viruses? And then the second PICO is similar, but it's referring to the population that is healthcare personnel who administer ACAM 2000 or care for patients vaccinated with replicating orthopox viruses, for example, in clinical trials. So moving on to the second half of this uh, table here, re uh, referring to the booster doses. The work group deter determined that regarding booster doses similar to ACAM 2000, only persons with continued or sustained risk for orthopox viruses should receive boosters at specific time intervals. Which brings us to the uh, specific booster recommendations. The work group felt that an increased frequency for more virulent orthopox viruses still made sense and that the frequency for those working with smallpox and monkeypox for that reason should be more frequent than, um, than those who are working with less virulent pathogens. And two years was the preferred time interval um, for reasons that I'll explain in the next presentation uh, that shows the grade data. The worker felt the frequency of boosters for those working with the less virulent pathogens um, should be specifically delineated at a specific time point because if it was simply a clinical guidance that a booster needs to be given, uh, the concern was that um, it would fall off people's radar and they would not know to get a booster. Um, Ten years was somewhat arbitrarily chosen for that reason, and I'll explain more during the next presentation. So um, this is how we derived the third and fourth PICO questions regarding booster doses, and the, the, peak, the, the actual questions are listed here. Should persons who are at continued risk for occupational exposure to more virulent orthopox viruses, such as variola virus or monkeypox virus, receive a booster dose of Genios every two years after the primary Genios series? And uh, PICO number four is should persons who are at continued risk for occupational exposure to replication competent orthopox viruses like vaccinia virus or cowpox or Alaska pox, and um, there's many more, receive a booster dose of Genios at least every 10 years after the primary Genios series. 
Now, there's one more PICO question that Dr. Um, Sanchez mentioned that we've developed since the February ACIP meeting, and I'll get to that at the uh, very end of the next several slides. Um, that is a new new uh, PICO question and um, an explanation of some important distinctions between Genios and ACAM 2000 may explain uh, why we came to that. And um, the this, these distinctions will also explain some of the evidence to recommendations um, answers that the work group uh, came up with. So in this table here, we have um, a, you know, a comparison of ACAM 2000 and Genios, and I have here in the red box the features of, of Genios. Um, for all of the, um, the variables that are listed in the far left column. So the effectiveness is believed to be about the same for these two vaccines, but, some, but nearly everything else listed here on this slide are different. And I'll go into more detail in the next few slides about this, but just to highlight some of those, Genios is a replication deficient modified vaccinia Ankara, whereas, uh, whereas ACAM2000 is replication competent. Um, because Genios is replication deficient, there isn't that concern for, um, for, uh, for um, uh, replication that's unchecked replication and an adverse, serious adverse events that would result from that and um, auto inoculation and spread to others. Uh, cardiac adverse events, myopericarditis is known to occur 5.7 per 1,000 primary vaccinees for ACAM2000, according to the package insert, and uh, Genios is believed to be lower. Um, and then finally, the last two rows here, um, they're administered differently. So uh, ACAM2000, there's a very special way that it's administered that involves a bifurcated needle and multiple puncture wounds. It's, it's very unique, uh, whereas Genios is administered subcutaneously in two doses. Um, ACAM2000 is a single dose, so Genios is two doses subcutaneously about 28, 28 days apart. Um, something called a take occurs, and I'll show you a picture of that on the next slide with ACAM2000, and that can be in, that is infectious, and unless dressings are done appropriately, can result in spread of vaccinia to, to oneself um, in other parts of your body or spread to others. And for Genios, there is no take. So as mentioned on the previous slide, there's a special needle here that's involved in administering ACAM2000, uh, shown here in the top left, the bifurcated needle. Um, and then the takes that only occurs with ACAM2000 are shown, the evolution of it isn't shown in the, the right side of your screen. And I, as I mentioned, these, uh, this is infectious if the dressings are not uh, maintained properly. There's also adverse events that can occur after live replication competent orthopox vaccines like AKM2000. AKM There's quite a lot, as you can see, listed on this slide. I won't go into them in, in a whole lot of detail, but just to show you that um, everything from auto inoculation to um, post vaccinal encephalitis, encephalomyelitis, generalized vaccinia, Stevens Johnson syndrome, and even fetal death can occur. The ACAM2000 package insert acknowledges that there's a lot of warnings and precautions, and these are actually taken uh, directly from the, the wording on the, uh, on the package insert. Um, this word contraindicated is actually specifically used, um, although I recognize this isn't truly a contraindication. It's more of a, uh, an issue with, um, with any vaccine that you're going to give to persons who have severe immunodeficiencies. They may not have a benefit. Um, I included it in, with the wording contraindicated because that is the way it's listed on the package insert. Um, some individuals, though, the package insert clearly says um, experience serious adverse events, and these, uh, the risk for these uh, increases in certain populations, like pregnant persons, infants under 12 months of age, persons with, treated with tropical, topical steroids for eye disease, those with a history of cardiac disease or presence of eczema and other skin conditions, and serious adverse events may result in severe disability, permanent neurologic sequela, um, and or death. And then the package insert also mentions contact spread can lead to inadvertent inoculation and infection to household members and close contacts. The Genius package insert, however, in terms of warnings and precautions, they do mention that immunocompromised persons may have a diminished immune response to vaccine, which perhaps is expected for vaccines in general. Um, insufficient data to inform Genios vaccine associated risks in pregnancy and during lactation. But all of the other adverse events that are listed on the previous slide for ACAM 2000 are not mentioned. 
So we drafted this to just show a comparison between uh, the two vaccines based on the information that's in the package insert. And again, the title relative contraindications really probably doesn't apply to the, the condition that's lo listed on the third row here where it says condition associated with immunosuppression. But um, all of the other things, um, I guess relative contraindications does apply. And you can see that there's a lot of them listed here for, for a vaccinee who has any of the conditions listed on the left. And even even if that individual has um, a household contact who has any of those, then the, that can be a precaution. And, and people tend to hesitate, obviously, um, if they have a, a pregnant person in their household or if they have a young child with eczema or, or, or what have you because of their concern for spreading it through that um, infectious take. And Genios, on the other hand, the only things mentioned here um, really are pregnancy, uh, breastfeeding, and um, uh, you know, serious vaccine component allergy. Obviously, if you have a serious vaccine component allergy, then it wouldn't be recommended for you to receive the vaccine. So um, given all of this, Genios like ACAM2000, um, there's been a lot of, well, Genios, there's been a lot of um, requests for it, just given all of the information that I've presented. Genios like ACAM2000 would be available from the U.S. government stockpiles. There would be no vaccine cost to recipients because of that, and this factors um, a little bit into the evidence to recommendations answers. It's also a familiar administration technique. I just wanted to reiterate the subcutaneous um, rather than a multiple punctures with bifurcated needle. It involves a non-replicating virus, and so for that reason, there's a lower risk for serious adverse events, no concern for in inadvertent infection or spread to others, and fewer relative contraindications. Um, and then just to reiterate again, uh, given these differences, there have been many requests made to us at CDC about when Genios will be available to people who um, have not been vaccinated for ACAM2000, but also those persons who were vaccinated with ACAM2000 and are interested in getting uh, their booster doses with Genios going forward. So because of all of those requests, we developed the last the last. Uh, PICO, the last PICO question, which is listed here on this slide. And this is the one that is new since the February meeting, and it states, should persons who are at continued risk for occupational exposure to orthopox viruses and who received an ACAM2000 primary vaccination receive a booster dose of Genios as an option to a booster dose of ACAM2000? And um, the reverse of uh, switching from Genios to ACAM2000 2000 is not a PICO question, as we expect it will be very rare, um, and we anticipate clinical guidance pertaining to this, which will be discussed at the, the next ACIP meeting in October. So um, during the next presentation, I'll, um, I'll insert some of these difference, differences. I'll explain why they're important uh, to the evidence to recommendations framework, but I will end this presentation here and take any questions. Are there any clarifying questions from our members? Ms. Bata. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Rao. Um, just a clarification when you were discussing the contraindications um, regarding immune deficiency, would, would it, ACAM would be <clears throat> contraindicated because of the viral replication that's occurring, um, and less about um, an immune response. Is that correct? Oh, yes, that's correct. Um, that's correct. I'll pull that slide up again, but yes, that is correct. Slide 21. Here we go. Okay. Yes, that's correct, that because of that unchecked replication that's happening, you have more serious adverse events. Um, you have uh, problems with people who have exfoliative skin conditions and um, underlying, underlying illnesses because of that. Thank you. Any other clarifying questions from the committee? Dr. Rao, I think. Oh, sorry. Dr. Long, go ahead. I'm getting more confused about, so this, this new vaccine is a non-replicating vaccine. So why do you have any contraindication? Contraindications usually uh, is risk of harm. So if you might not respond, that's one thing, but we usually don't call that a contraindication if you're immune suppressed. For instance, influenza vaccine um, that's inactivated. So isn't this 
this is not a live replicating virus vaccine. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I think the word that I used, the contraindications piece, is is, is a bad word, and I shouldn't have used that. Um, so I can change it. But what I, I suppose what the what it was supposed to convey is that people with immunosuppression are not really going to mount a response, which is probably no different from lots of vaccines. And so I wouldn't really call that um, a contraindication because it wouldn't be harmful to give it to the patient. They just wouldn't necessarily have an effective response. Pregnancy and breastfeeding, and if you have a serious vaccine component allergy, then those are reasons to potentially pause because there's no data uh, about the impact of this vaccine in them. But, um, but you're correct that it's a non-replicating vaccine. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised, so I think Dr. Rao, if you'd like to go uh, directly into your ETR presentation, that would be terrific. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think as has men been mentioned earlier by Dr. Sanchez, our, we did a, a very thorough grade assessment, and those evidence tables were shared with the ACIP through the the share file. I believe they will also be posted online at a later date, but um, they're also included. A lot of the great information is included in this presentation, including as the extra slides. Um, but because, uh, because it was shared beforehand, I'm going to go over a lot of the great things um, relatively quickly, but we did make every effort to ensure that uh, there's a lot of footnotes to explain why things were downgraded, and um, hopefully those will answer any questions that come up. So I will go ahead and get started. So just as a reminder, we have five PICOs. The first two are related to primary vaccination with Gineos in at-risk populations. The third and the fourth are about the frequency of the booster dose in persons with continued risk. And the last one is about a change from a booster with ACAM 2000 to a booster with Gineos. Um, and because there's a lot of similarity in the answers uh, to the ETRs for the for one and two, and also for the for ETRs three and four, the second of those pairs will be presented relatively quickly. The answers are very similar for the two. So I'll get started with the evidence to recommendations framework or the ETRs for one and two about primary vaccination. So as we know, orthopox virus infections do cause morbidity and mortality. There are several populations at occupational risk. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're focused on the ones that the ACIP recommendations would directly apply to, and these are research and clinical laboratory personnel performed, performing diagnostic testing for orthopox viruses, designated response teams approved by public health authorities, and select healthcare personnel who might choose to be vaccinated um, even if their risk is low, like people who administer ACAM 2000 or care for patients after vaccination with re replication competent orthopox viruses. Uh, for example, persons enrolled in clinical trials. So ACAM 2000 is currently recommended by the ACIP, and that is not changing. There are benefits to having more than one recommended vaccine available, um, and the vaccinations are effective. Uh, breakthrough infection with ACIP has only been reported to us uh, one time, and that reference listed here is that time that it was reported. Um, of course, there's no there's no uh, perfect surveillance for this or anything like that, but um, it is it is good to know that we haven't been we haven't heard about um, breakthrough infections otherwise. So this is the first PICO, and um, I'll just reiterate here, the policy question is, should Genios be recommended for research and clinical laboratory personnel performing diagnostic testing for orthopox viruses and for designated response teams at risk for occupational exposure to ortho orthopox viruses? And the footnotes um, explain a little bit more about what we mean by these. Um, I'll just provide a little bit of an example. As far as designated response teams goes, there was a CDC memo um, uh, many years ago, well, not many years ago, but in the 2000s that, um, that referred to people getting vaccinated for preparedness purposes, and um, those might be designated response teams that a pub public health authorities um, approve for, for preparedness purposes. Uh, now, the, the population is that group. The intervention is vaccination with Genios. And the comparison here, I, I want to point out, it's ACAM 2000. And the reason for that is because ACAM 2000 is what is currently recommended uh, for vaccination for these persons. And so we could not put no, no vaccination in as a comparison. We needed to put um, ACAM 2000. And the, the um, data in the RCTs and everything going forward in the, in the next 
many slides uh, reflect that fact that our comparator here was ACAM 2000. And so RCTs had to be ones that involved um, ACAM 2000 in one of the arms. So um, when we first showed this to the ACIP, we had four uh, outcomes that we thought were critical, but on further review, the work group felt that severity of disease is, is important rather than critical. And so even though we uh, did end up doing all of the grade tables, including for severity of disease, I will, and those are posted in the share drive uh, presentation by Dr. Whitehill, I will leave that out, the grade tables for severity of disease from this presentation. So when, oops, um, the first uh, the first question that's asked in the uh, among the domains in the ETR is about benefits and harms, and there are several questions asked. The first is how substantial are the desirable anticipated effects, and the work group concluded that the desirable anticipated effects are small. Um, this is because the evidence table for outcome A, which I'll show in a moment, prevention of disease, suggests there is a small benefit of GINEOS compared to ACAM 2000 for prevention of disease. Um, FDA also found GINEOS to be non-inferior to ACAM 2000 for immunogenicity, and GINEOS is a non-replicating virus, so there is no potential spread to other others. Um, this question really relies on the grade table to answer, and the reason we came up with small can be shown here. This is the grade table. Uh, Demetric mean titer and seroconversion rates are two different indirect measures of prevention of disease. The mean differences, difference in titer units between those who received GINEOS versus those who received a live replicating vaccinia vaccine, either ACAM 2000 or Drivax, was 1.62 titer units higher with a 95% confidence interval from 1.32 to 1.99 titer units higher. And then for seroconversion rates, which is another, mark, uh, another measure of uh, prevention of disease, those who received GINEOS were 1.02 times more likely to seroconvert versus those who received Drivax or ACAM 2000. And the 95% confidence interval ranged from 0.99 to 1. Point, uh, sorry, to 1.05. And so it crossed um, one. And so it's it's these it's these values that led to the uh, work group to say that there seems to be a small benefit of um, of Genios compared to ACAM 2000. Now for harms, the the next question under the benefits and harms domain is how substantial are the undesirable anticipated effects? And these were determined to be minimal, again, based on the, the evidence tables or the grade tables. Genios is a non-replicating vaccinia virus, so as shown in the last presentation, there were fewer relative contraindications to Genios compared to ACAM 2000. The grade tables evaluating serious adverse events and myopericarditis were used to answer this question. And the RCTs and the evidence tables, just as another reminder, they only included RCTs that compared Genios to ACAM 2000. Um, the details, uh, are the details of the, um, the the evidence tables are listed here in these two sub bullets to explain um, to explain them a little bit more. Suggested serious adverse events were less likely with Genios, but too few subjects enrolled to assess for this rare event. And we did include observational data because uh, we weren't satisfied, I guess, with the RCTs, and there were very few subjects enrolled. And we were reassured to find that um, it too showed fewer serious adverse events and myopericarditis, and there were many more people enrolled in those. And so in the red boxes here are those numbers again uh, to show you that there seemed to be, to show you how the work group came up with minimal harms. Um, and this is the same for myopericarditis, which is also part of harms. Um, and if you're interested at all in the reasons for our downgrading of various things, we we took um, Dr. Florence Whitehill, who, who really led the, the great effort, and made some um, extensive footnote notes that are included in this presentation at the very end, and you can refer to those. Oops. All right, so um, how do the desirable effects outweigh the undesirable effects? The work group felt that it favors the intervention because the benefits were small, but the harms are minimal. The desirable effects therefore outweigh the undesirable effects and the intervention is favored. 
And then the certainty of the evidence is a question. And from the grade tables, you probably noticed the second to last column is about the certainty level. I've consolidated them here into this slide um, just so that it's clear. And the benefits are, are in green, prevention of disease, and the the harms in red, serious adverse events, and myopericarditis. And you can see that for prevention of disease, the certainty level was moderate. And for serious adverse events and myopericarditis, it was low. Uh, so prevention of disease is the, um, is the only critical outcome that assessed effectiveness of the intervention. And after considering the GMT and um, seroconversion rate data together, we have moderate certainty that there is a small increase in disease prevention provided by Genios compared to ACAM 2000. And that's how we filled in that one. And, um, and then we estimated that there are fewer serious adverse events in myopericarditis cases after Genio's primary series compared to ACAM 2000 vaccination, but have low certainty in this estimate. And the, the reasons that this was downgraded again are, are explained in, um, in this slide and also in the footnotes, but just in the interest of time since they are listed in the footnotes um, and were part of the background reading, I will skip over those unless there are questions at the end. Um, the next domain is values. Does the target population feel that the desirable effects are large relative to the undesirable effects? And the work group felt probably yes. Um, we did a, at CDC did in 2015 a survey of 275 healthcare workers in the Democratic Republic of Congo or DRC to evaluate the target population's values. And we found that 99% of those people had reported having seen a monkeypox case there. And most of them had said that it was in their line of duty. Um, greater than 75% of those were not interested in ACAM 2000 after it was explained to them, many of them citing adverse events, the potential for auto-inoculation, and not wanting a vaccine scar. Um, but then subsequently, when Genios was explained to these individuals, 98% were interested in Genios. And so while this was a unpublished survey that we performed in another country, we thought that this data was was uh, somewhat telling about, in general, what the target population in the United States might feel. Um, and we already know that the target population has made multiple requests about when this vaccine might be available to them. Uh, another question under the, domain, the values domain, is there important uncertainty about or variability in how much people value the main outcomes? So. Um, there's no research identified, but stakeholders expect, are expected to value the immunity. Uh, Two-dose Genios is found to be non-inferior to ACAM 2000 for immunogenicity by FDA. And uh, two doses of Genios administered over 28 days, um, but there's only one vaccination for ACAM 2000, so it will take longer for someone to have uh, appropriate Im um, immunity after the two-dose Genios. But, um, but uh, we still felt that uh, the answer was probably no impor important uncertainty or variability. For the acceptability domain, there is ease in, in finding a provider because um, many providers, even though any provider can give um, ACAM 2000 by using the bifurcated needle, many people do not want to. Um, we know that some vaccinees have had difficulty finding someone who can administer ACAM 2000 or getting onto the, the schedule, for example, at a military facility when they work outside of um, in the civilian arena. And so we, we know that those would all be uh, removed from the equation here and acceptability would be uh, higher because of the ease in finding a provider, um, no absences from work to travel to a provider who may give the vaccine, and, um, and many more providers would be comfortable administering a subcutaneous injection. Also, it's a non-replicating virus, so there's no risk of transmission to others, particularly to the immunocompromised persons and those with eczema, and the adverse events are expected to be more rare. So for those reasons, the work group felt, yes, the intervention is acceptable to key stakeholders. So then um, the work group felt that Genios is a reasonable and an efficient allocation of resources. Genios, like ACAM 2000, would be provided from um, HHS's Strategic National Stockpile, or SNS, free of cost to the patient. And even in cases where an employer might not cover the cost of clinic appointments, there may actually be similar clinic costs associated with Genios and, e and ACAM 2000, even though Genios is, um, is a two-dose series. And this is because in, in um, some 
some clinics, patients return for in-person clinic appointments on multiple days after ACAM 2000 administration, um, certainly on day seven, but sometimes day three and many times afterwards to perform dressing changes, to assess the take site, to um, ask questions about whether the patient is experiencing any symptoms that could be consistent with myopericarditis. And so the in, in the end, the number of um, visits that uh, a person would have to uh, pay for on their own if their employer was not paying for it, it would be uh, the same or possibly fewer than with ACAM 2000. So equity, um, equity would be increased because for some vaccine recipients, the cost of clinic appointments is absorbed by the provider and there's no additional charges, but uh, there would be fewer costs overall because there wouldn't be those challenges associated with finding a provider, traveling to see that provider. Uh, we've heard anecdotally from, um, from individuals who work in laboratories with um, non-virulent orthopox viruses that the, the cost is, is sometimes absorbed by them themselves and that they have to get a hotel and pay the cost of the hotel as well. And, and all of that um, would, not having to deal with all of that would actually increase equity. And then the final domain is feasibility. There's, there's no research identified, but the subject matter experts on the work group felt that the same number or possibly fewer clinic visits would be needed, but also um, the amount of providers that could provide this would be so much larger than with ACAM 2000 because uh, many people are, most people are comfortable administering a subcutaneous injection, and so the, um, it would be feasible. Um, Genios, one issue though listed on this last bullet is that Genios once thawed or refrigerated is good for 12 hours, whereas thawed ACAM 2000 is good for 18 months, and so this is an issue that CDC is evaluating, um, whether to distribute Genios at negative 20 degrees Celsius uh, to to bypass this issue, and the product sponsor is also assessing more lenient cold chain requirements. So that is the only aspect that potentially could impair feasibility, but still uh, the worker felt that this is feasible to implement. And so just to summarize all of the answers that we had for each of those domains, I've listed them here on this slide. Um, and to make it somewhat easier, you can see that the things in green are, are generally favorable and the things in red are not. Um, I just want to point out that uh, part of the reason that the overall certainty of the evidence here was low is, um, is, is because there, you know, we had to use as our comparator ACAM 2000 a lot of these these uh, trials were not set up with ACAM 2000 as one of the arms, and when this data became observational, it automatically became level three, which is low. And that explains really why the certainty levels for a lot of these uh, questions are low. It's that as well as the fact that um, there weren't always a lot of people enrolled in the RCTs when uh, ACAM 2000 was used as a comparator. And this leaves us with uh, the balance of consequences, which is that the desirable consequences probably outweigh the undesirable consequences in most settings. And the work group um, recommended um, this to the ACIP, and the actual proposed recommendation is listed here on this slide. But in the interest of time, I will just skip over it um, and just let you know that we did draft uh, proposed recommendations for all five. Moving on to PICO number two. So as I mentioned before, the answers to uh, the ETR questions are, are mostly identical to that for PICO one, but I'm gonna point out some of the ways that it's different. Um, as you'll remember, this is the population here is healthcare personnel who administer ACAM 2000 or care for patients after the uh, vaccination with replication competent orthopox viruses. And you may also recall that the entire population may not benefit from being vaccinated, but individual members of the population may be interested in being vaccinated just because the risk is much lower than, um, I mean, just because of, of personal preferences, wanting it to be available, and um, also um, because ACAM 2000 specifically, the, the, it, it says can be offered in the ACIP recommendations, um, there's clearly a, an interest from some people. So once again, we have three outcomes here that are included in the grade table. Um, I've listed here the, the benefits and harms dom the domain, the answers to these, and they are all identical to the, the ones that I presented for ETR number one because it was the same grade table that, was, that, um, that answered this question. And so those are summarized here. 
And moving on to uh, values, the only difference to the answers to the other ETR domains were, were the two questions in the values domain. So for the question, does the target population feel that the desirable effects are large relative to undesirable effects? There's no research data to evaluate this, but it's believed that some members of the population will be interested in vaccination. As I just mentioned, they would like the option, um, even if it's not indicated for the entire population. And, the, and in the past, when patients were admitted with adverse events from replicating orthopox virus vaccines, healthcare workers were anxious and appreciated the opportunity. One of our worker members specifically remembers this happening. And um, as I already just said, allowing for these persons to be vaccinated is consistent with the ACIP recommendations for ACAM 2000. And so the work group felt that the answer here was probably yes, which is different from what was given for um, the first DTR. And um, for the second question in values, is there important uncertainty about or variability in how much people value the main outcomes? Because of the low risk, many persons within this population may opt to not be vaccinated and others may, for the factors previously discussed, opt to be vaccinated. There's some variability in how much people value this uh, recommendation or the value the uh, main outcomes, uh, potentially indicating it could be recommended by shared clinical decision making. And for this reason, the work group felt possibly, possibly important uncertainty um, or variability. And everything else in this ETR is identical to what I just explained um, in the first ETR. I just summarized them here. And then the entire list is uh, of domains. The answers are provided here, with the two highlighted ones being the only ones that are different from the first ETR. And so the work groups um, felt that the desirable consequences probably outweigh the undesirable consequences in most settings and proposed this recommendation for the wording, which states that the ACIP recommends GINEOS based on shared clinical decision-making as an alternative to ACAM 2000 for healthcare personnel who administer ACAM 2000 or care for patients vaccinated with replication-competent orthopox viruses. So then moving on to ETRs three and four, and uh, these are about the booster, the frequency of the booster doses with Genios after a Genios primary series. The, uh, the problem is that uh, there's virulent orthopox viruses. There, in, there are increasing numbers of laboratories that are working with monkeypox virus, for example. There's a lot of primate laboratories work with these typically require personal protective equipment and other safeguards, but ensuring long-term immunogenicity through a booster provides an additional level of protection if unintentional breaches occur. And then less virulent orthopox viruses, the morbidity may be prevented. For example, a mild case of vaccinia infection occurred in a laboratory in the United States who had not received a booster greater than 10 years after his primary ACAM 2000 vaccination. And it's possible that this could potentially have been prevented if the, if the individual had, been, um, had received a booster per the ACIP recommendations for every 10 years. And we, and we don't know for sure, but potentially the boosters are, um, are, are helpful. The stakes are higher to individual and public health if the if virulent orthopox virus infections are acquired. And for this reason, uh, our booster recommendations, similar to those for ACAM 2000, are, are, are for more frequent intervals for those working with the more virulent orthopox viruses than those working with the less virulent orthopox viruses. So I'm showing the same slide that was presented during the previous meeting when I said their previous presentation when I said that I would explain a little bit more how we came up with every two years and at least every 10 years for Genios. And um, I will um, explain that here. So the uh, policy question here is for those who are at continued re uh, risk for occupational exposure to more virulent orthopox viruses, such as variola virus or monkeypox virus, to receive a booster dose of Genios every two years after the primary Genios series. And um, this came from partly from the data that was available to us. We um, uh, we felt that the first domain, how substantial are the desirable anticipated effects, that from the evidence tables, there is a small increase in disease prevention after the Genios booster, um, after the Genios primary series, and boosters at recommended time intervals may provide reassur reassurance of continued protection from inadvertent exposures 
because smallpox and monkeypox are highly virulent. And um, the, the data here in the observational studies is actually specific to the two-year time point. And so this is the reason that the worker proposed two years as the most conservative time point at which Genios boosters might be recommended for those interacting with the most virulent um, orthopox viruses where um, the effect of the, the booster is, is most important. And again, because uh, the footnotes and all in these tables um, explain our, our reasoning for this, I'm just going to skip over this and just say that this is uh, where we got the small for benefits. And what it said is we estimate that there is a small increase in disease prevention after Genios booster versus just Genios primary series. Um, and then, of course, there's low certainty in this estimate for the reasons I explained earlier and that we'll talk about uh, when we get to that part of the domain. For harms, there were no serious adverse events or myop myopericarditis cases observed among those persons who received Genios booster dose two years after Genios primary series. The adverse events are expected to be minimal because no harmful events were observed. The effect estimate for the randomized control trials and observational data were not estimable because there were no recorded events of vaccine-related serious adverse events after the booster. But you can still see that the denominators are so small, are too small to have identified a serious adverse event, including in the observational studies. And um, th there were no cases, so that is good, but um, that, um, that is one of the reasons this ended up very low certainty. Here, too, for myopericarditis, there were no cases, but the number of enrolled subjects was extremely low for both arms. The effect estimate for the randomized control uh, trial was not estimable because there were no recorded events of myopericarditis and there was no observational data. Um, but with the available data, we, you know, we couldn't, uh, so we couldn't estimate the effect of Genios plus a booster compared to Genios primary series. And for this, that harms question, only the data from the series adverse events was taken. Uh, do the desirable effects outweigh the undesirable effects? We felt it favors the intervention. The benefits listed are small, but the harms are minimal. The desirable effects therefore outweigh the undesirable effects, and the intervention is favored. Now here again are the, the I, uh, I've compiled all of the certainty of evidence uh, for the outcomes, and they are all very low. Um, and hopefully the grade table explains why that is the case. Part of it is that the ACAM 2000 comparator resulted in not too many studies in the RCTs. Or sorry, in this question, it's the Genios alone, but there wasn't much, uh, many um, RCT data on that. And the denominators were very low for assessing these things, including in observational data. Um, and then based on that data, we for effectiveness of the intervention, the certainty of the evidence was very low for the reasons described here. And also on the grade tables that are um, online. And then for the safety of the intervention, also very low. And again, I will skip over this since the grade tables were shared before the meeting. For target population sentiments, there's, um, there's no research uh, on this, but a booster dose is expected to be interpreted as having large desirable effects relative to undesirable effects, particularly when you're working with highly virulent pathogens. Um, the desirable effect is protection from inadvertently acquiring these pathogens, and there are no undesirable effects, and so the work group felt probably yes. Uh, the target population would feel that the desirable effects are large relative to the undesirable effects. Um, now, for the question of um, is there important uncertainty about or variability in how much people value the main outcomes, uh, the stakeholders, um, vaccinees, and employers are expected to value persistent immunity, and employers of persons who work with smallpox currently mandate booster doses and diligently enforce compliance. This is at CDC, so probably there would be no important uncertainty or variability. Acceptability um, of the intervention, the work group felt yes, that there is data, albeit limited, to indicate boostability two years after the primary series. This is one year sooner than the booster frequency for ACAM 2000, but ACAM 2000 at, at one point was actually recommended annually, and as more data became available, was pushed back to every three years. So um, this is expected to still be acceptable to stakeholders, and ACAM 2000 booster doses 
Um, uh, sorry, yes, and clinicians are more willing to administer subcutaneous injections and identifying a provider will not be difficult, all of which contributed to the, the yes answer here. Resource use, is this intervention a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources? The answer uh, was yes, for the same reasons that we've ex uh, that I explained in the previous questions. Genios is provided free of cost from the SNS. For most people, the, our employers will pay the cost of clinic appointments, and for those, um, for those whom it does not, uh, stakeholders are accustomed to booster doses being needed, and um, because many more clinicians would be willing to administer it, uh, it, it probably wouldn't be too difficult finding a clinic. Um, equity uh, would be probably no impact because many employers will pay the cost of the clinic appointment. Some may not, but because Genios is more accessible, the cost would not involve a hotel and travel costs, and there's no other costs that are expected for the vaccine. And then finally, feasibility, there's no research identified. It may take some effort to plan for booster doses, but since nearly every provider will be willing to administer a subcutaneous vaccine, scheduling can be with a wide variety of providers, which likely makes it feasible. And then as I previously mentioned, um, there is uh, this issue with the thawed product being good for a shorter amount of time, which you know, obviously is important for these non-emergency situations when we're not sure when the vaccine might be utilized. But um, CDC is working on uh, determining whether it can be distributed at negative 20 degrees Celsius, and also the product sponsor is assessing more lenient cold chain requirements. So in summary, the answers are all, uh, the answers to the questions are all listed here, and all of the positive things are listed in green, and some of the things um, that hopefully I explained are listed in red. And the final balance of consequences by the work group was that the desirable consequences probably outweigh the undesirable consequences in most setting. And this next slide shows the exact wording that the work group developed um, for, for when the, the votes are considered at the next meeting. Now, um, going back to this table again, the last line is referring to booster doses for those working with less virulent pathogens, and it, it says at least every 10 years, and I'll explain a little bit how we came to that. So um, they're actually, the recommendation for ACAM 2000 is every 10 years. There's no data beyond that two-year time point that I showed in the previous grade table for boostability. Um, the, the work group felt strongly that, it, that a booster should be given, um, and the concern was that if there's not a specific recommendation and if it's simply guidance that is given, that uh, boosters will be forgotten and not given to persons who are working with these less virulent pathogens. And so we, we went back and forth on what interval would make sense given that there is no data about specifically about this 10-year time point and um, in the end felt that 10 years is, is aligned with what is recommended for ACAM 2000. And that is why we are proposing that, um, realizing that it, it is somewhat arbitrarily chosen. Now, all of the um, information from the, uh, from the grade tables to, that populated the benefits and harms domains are the same as those for the question that I just went through. Um, one thing I just want to point out is that uh, for, for indirectness uh, from the observational studies, it, uh, it was downgraded to serious for the fourth the, the 30 TR, but for this one, very serious because there's no data specifically for the 10-year time point, and so it got downgraded twice there. Um, here again are all of the answers to the other questions, which are the same as what I presented for the previous question, uh, for the previous ETR. The only difference is, is highlighted here, reasonable and efficient allocation of resources. And um, the, the worker felt the costs of clinic visits are likely acceptable, even though this population works with less virulent pathogens. And so probably yes was the answer that was just settled on there. And then finally, balance of consequences. Uh, the worker felt the desirable consequences probably outweigh undesirable consequences in most settings. And here is the wording for, for the exact recommendation here that says that um, a booster dose should be given, um, it should say here, um, at, um, at least every 10 years. And then finally, ETR number five. So the problem here is health authorities and Genios 
Uh, the Genio sponsor are routinely being asked when this vaccine will be available. Some laboratory directors have indicated that many of those who receive ACAM 2000 boosters would like to change to Genios if the ACIP recommendations explicitly allow for this. And all of the reasons that we've already discussed are the reasons that um, that those that have been presented to us. There is also this unpublished data from the Democratic Republic of Condo, Congo indicating that Genios is preferred to ACAM 2000. And that's the reason that this PICO question was was drafted. And this PICO is, should persons who are at continued risk for occupational exposure to orthopox viruses and who received an ACAM 2000 booster vaccination receive a booster dose of Genios as an option to a booster dose of ACAM 2000? And the population, there are all these people who are at risk for occupational exposure. Intervention is booster with Genios. Comparison with booster is booster with ACAM 2000. And the same three outcomes. So how substantial are the desirable anticipated effects? I'll show you on the next few slides. There's uh, you know, no data on this, so uh, there's very little data. So there's only observational data available, and there was no available comparison data for that. So it really is unknown from the evidence table how substantial the desirable anticipated effects are. And for that reason, um, the work group felt the answer is don't know. And what I just explained here where there's no comparison data is shown here on this slide. Now, for how substantial are the undesirable anticipated effects, there are no serious adverse events or myopericarditis cases identified from the evidence table. We estimate that there were fewer serious adverse events after Genio's booster versus ACAM 2000 booster in people previously vaccinated with ACAM 2000. The effect was not estimable for myopericarditis, but no cases were identified in either of those arms. And so the grade, um, uh, the grade tables are indicating that there are very minimal undesirable anticipated anticipated effects. And uh, what I just explained is, is in the red boxes here and also explained in the footnotes. Um, now, uh, for this slide as well, this is also one of the harms. And, and then the benefit to harm ratio, because we don't know if there are benefits to administering Genios boosters compared to ACAM 2000 boosters, um, the work group settled on unclear as uh, for an answer about whether the desirable effects outweigh the undesirable effects. There's no identified harms, and there's no reason to suspect that there would be no benefit for, from a Genios booster, but uh, the answer would still be unclear. And here again, the, the certainty of the outcomes was all very low. Um, the overall certainty here was very low for the reasons explained here, um, and then also for the safety inter uh, of the intervention, uh, very low. And just because of time, I'll skip over these things here. Uh, target population sentiments. The target populations have made multiple requests for this vaccine. There's unpublished data from the DRC indicating a strong interest. And so we felt that the desirable effects are large relative to the undesirable effects. Is there an important uncertainty about or variability in how much people value the main outcomes? There's no research here, but anecdotally, we do know that some laboratory directors anticipate many of their staff changing to Genios boosters if the ACIP explicitly indicates it's acceptable. Um, but that is why we said probably no important uncertainty or variability. Is the intervention acceptable to key stakeholders? Yes, because of the ease of finding a provider to administer the vaccine, no risk of transmission to others, no absences from work or uh, to travel to get the vaccine or self costs associated with getting it and fewer relative contraindications. For um, is the intervention a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources? Yes because it's provided by the SNS free of cost to the patients. And be, since employers mostly absorb the clinic costs, um, they would absorb those for ACAM 2000 if that was the uh, booster dose that was given. And um, the same number of clinic visits, if not fewer, would be expected with uh, Genios compared to ACAM 2000. Equity was thought to be probably increased for those whose employers do not absorb clinic visits. Uh, there's no cost associated with traveling to a provider who's willing to administer ACAM 2000 using a bifurcated ne needle. And there's increased accessibility to the vaccine because more providers can actually are willing to give it. 
And then feasibility, finally, is the intervention feasible? Yes, we estimate that the same number of clinics, um, cl same number of clinic visits would be needed and that more providers would be able to administer it. And the thawing issue is the only issue that might interfere with feasibility, but there are um, potential solutions being considered at this time. So again, here are all the, this is the summary of the responses to the domains. And the work group felt that the desirable consequences probably outweigh undesirable consequences in most settings. And the recommendation was phrased this way. The ACIP recommends persons where it continued risk for occupational exposure to orthopox viruses and who received an ACAM 2000 primary vaccination receive a, vac receive a booster dose of Genios as an option to a booster dose of ACAM 2000. And that is the um, ETR in uh, lightning speed there, just so that we could stay relatively on schedule. I'd like to thank all of the people listed on this slide. This was quite a lot of effort um, from the ACIP workgroup members, as well as um, from various people across CDC. So thank you. I can take questions. Thank you, Dr. Rao, and I really appreciate um, the amount of work that your team has done and also and that you were able to efficiently present it. So really, we really appreciate that. Um, this presentation is open for questions. Maybe I'll ask Dr. Sanchez, are there any key issues that he would like the ACIP members to explore based on the presentation from today? No, I think um, Agam did a, a great job in uh, putting all of this, uh, to, of the work group discussions together. Um, it really is the vaccine that, that, we, that there is much interest in having it um, recommended and used. So I think it's important to um, that we move forward as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Any clarification or other issues or, uh, uh, sorry, ACIP members or any liaisons feel would be important to address uh, prior to the next meeting? Dr. Alt. I think the word that we wanted to use about pregnancy and breastfeeding for this vaccine is probably precaution, not contraindication, uh, but somebody should check my use of the language. I think precaution is what we usually say when we don't have uh, data, So, but you guys can figure that out before we vote in October. Yes, no, thank you, Dr. Alt. We'll, we'll definitely look into that. The um, populations like pregnant persons and um, uh, lactate persons who are uh, breastfeeding, we plan on actually addressing that through clinical guidance. Um, because the package insert for Genio specifically says that there is not data for it and that it's, I believe it's listed in the warning and precautions section. Um, so it, it, it wouldn't necessarily be important to the vote, but we do plan on presenting that clinical guidance at the next meeting. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. I just wanted to add to um, to um, Dr. Hall's comment, and he, no, he's he's right. It's not listed even in the package insert as um, as contraindication, and we do need to work on that as well as for the compromised individuals, because um, it 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 shouldn't be a contraindication. Um, and so um, there. At least in the package insert, there is some animal data um, on Genios that um, was also favorable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fink. Uh, I, I thought maybe it would be helpful just to explain um, you know, from the regulatory standpoint that that when we label uh, use in, in pregnancy and and in lactating individuals, we um, are are required by regulation to uh, list uh, or to, to describe data and uncertainties uh, for each of those populations. Um, but for, for Genios, as, as has been pointed out uh, correctly, there is no warning or, or precaution uh, related to use in either 
pregnancy or, or lactating individuals. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification. Are there any additional items or questions people have for Dr. Rao and Dr. Sanchez? I guess if I could just say one thing, I would say that um, I know we went through the grade tables very quickly because those were shared before the meeting, but um, the footnotes should explain um, just, you know, we were very careful about when we downgraded. So if there are any questions about um, how the certainty level ended up where it was, um, I think that's the only issue that, that I guess I thought could potentially be something that ACIP members would have questions about. Uh, the low certainty level for many of these things, but um, still the ACIP work group uh, wanted to recommend them. Thank you for that clarification. And I'll just state that um, I know the members really appreciate receiving the information in advance of the meeting and specifically around the grade tables because it is a lot of information to share. So <laughs> thank you for doing that. Um, I don't see any additional hands raised. Uh, so I'll do one last call. Um, and I will thank all of our speakers uh, from this session as well as the entire day uh, for really ensuring that we have the information needed for upcoming votes. We have had a packed day and, and um, thanks to everyone for your patience. This was originally a two day meeting condensed into a one day meeting given all the emergency meetings we've been having in between. Um, so appreciate your additional day of time to allow us to discuss these important issues that are non COVID related. Um, so, Dr. Wharton and committee members, is there any further business or any objections to adjourning today's meeting? Uh, no, I think we can close. Okay, terrific. So, with that, I'll just say today's ACIP meeting is now adjourned, and I am sure we'll be talking to everyone again soon. Thank you for your time today, and thanks to the presenters. Take care. Bye.